so uh, welcome to the first uh, SIMA public talk of 2022. Uh, we'll be hearing from uh, Andrew Manning, who's a senior research programmer at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. Um, also works with uh, Gautam Narayan, who's a, a SIMA member and is a professor at the University of Illinois, Barna-Champaign. Um, Andrew will be talking to us about the, the imaginatively named circuses, cyber infrastructure for research collaborations using software environments for science, which has direct application uh, to multi semester astrophysics, but also to a range of other scientific tasks. And it's is part of our plans to, to, to integrate um, into the SIMA suite, and you'll see it actually working with one of the SIMA tools. Lastly, I'll say, as far as questions are concerned, uh, if you just raise your hand, I'll be I'll be monitoring questions because Andrew is probably in full screen and won't necessarily see it. And then I can, um, at an opportunity in time, I'll be able to say to him that there's a question and you can ask it. Or if you would rather I just uh, sort of read out your question, you can write it in the Slack channel. If I can't answer it myself or if Gautam is not able to answer it in the Slack, in, sorry, in the Zoom chat is what I meant to say. Um, I, I'll Gautam maybe I'll answer it or someone else, but. If not, we will we will ask Andrew, and then there will also be some time, hopefully, for, for questions at the end, if you have any. Well, thanks, Gavin. Okay, so I'll hand over to to Andrew to uh, to give us his first talk of 2022. Yeah, well, um, thank you very much for that introduction, and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I would like to first thank everyone for attending uh, this talk and the SIMA team for inviting me to be here. Today, as Adam said, I'm going to be uh, telling you about what I've whimsically dubbed circuses or the cyber infrastructure for research collaborations using software environments for science. Uh, if you like, as he explained, if you can interrupt me to ask questions, it'll be better often than waiting till the end when everyone's forgotten the context. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce myself and my background so you kind of see where I'm coming from. Uh, my name is Andrew Manning, and I'm a senior research programmer at NCSA. And Although I've been more or less embedded with astrophysicists since uh, coming to work at NCSA a few years ago, building cyber infrastructure for their computing needs, my background is actually atomic physics. My doctoral work was doing experiments studying quantum information processing and trapped ions. And after a five-year stint in uh, you know, corporate environment in Northrop Grumman, developing next-gen superconducting circuit technology, I moved here to Illinois, where I began my job at NCSA. So I'm kind of coming at this scientifically from a, a much different angle. So the first section of my talk introduces circuses from the perspective of the research collaborations and science use cases that motivate its design. And that's hopefully what will be most interesting to the, the folks in the audience. Um, yeah, so why circuses again? <laughs> Was it because all the other CI related acronyms have already been used? No, of course not. Um, it's because the creative marketing possibilities are endless. Starting a new academic research collaboration can feel like a circus. Let the computing experts at NCSA help you build your cloud-based infrastructures, <laughs> putting the CI in science. Um, but seriously, no one has condoned this marketing strategy. But in seriousness, uh, what I'm gonna present is a full stack cyber infrastructure capability and Kubernetes-based framework that's designed primarily for academic research collaborations. I'm gonna explain the system architecture and its design motivations, as well as some examples from existing projects that showcase the flexible deployment and some of the collaborative tools and services. Um, things like identity and access management, messaging, data sharing, code development, documentation, um, basically forming a, a research platform for science. So what are these research collaborations? The ones that benefit most from our framework uh, typically involve Researchers from multiple international institutions that often have hundreds of scientists sometimes with many different roles. You've got academic research professors, postdocs, graduate students, staff scientists, and they find that their new projects require data management as well as identity and access management um, services independent of the individual institutions. And that really introduces a, a conundrum for a lot, of, um, a lot of new collaborations when they start. Uh, this picture over here is of this recent NSF-funded MUSES collaboration that um, I'm a senior investigator on, just showing how scattered the people are across all these institutions and places. Um, 
we're highlighting here how this framework can serve the multi-messenger astronomy community, but this design is not astro specific at all. I'm just gonna reiterate that a few times. It's flexible enough for basically any research field. Uh, and there's more to consider than just the composition of a collaboration. You know, there's also the duration of a project and how long these people are gonna work together. You know, this little graphic over here of these projected timelines for these different surveys. Um, we are designing circuses to be maintainable for decades to come. So if we look at MMA specifically, if you were to characterize the CI needs of it with some keywords like robust, collaborative, real-time, and scalable, um, they would be nearly identical to the keywords describing our framework. And there's a lot of overlap here. Um, as we have in this, see in this linked paper and, and others, there, you know, the community has already identified key requirements for the next generation research, research platform uh, that they need. Um, some of which are listed here. And I'm hoping that by the end of the talk, I will have convinced you that our framework can be the foundation for a CI that meets these needs. Um, several survey groups, including CIMA, already use several common components for their communication and data sharing. But um, there's, a, there's a cross survey collaboration that's often not feasible, not because of lack of will, but just because of, uh, for you know, technical reasons. You can you know, think of the so-called wall garden problem with some of the services that they use. So that is to say, uh, circuses is more, is about more than just internal project collaboration. We want to enable inter-project collaboration too. So that, that informs our design choices, as you'll see. In fact, there are ongoing discussions about exactly this kind of collaboration between projects like SPT, LSST, and DES. Um, but you know, if the tools available to, available to these groups consist of a Linux command line with accounts individually provisioned by sysadmins, then to a quote a colleague, sharing is gonna be through tarballs emailed back and forth, which is what we want to avoid. So with circuses, we could enable a much deeper interaction and coordination between such groups. Uh, there's some, the, the, this historic observation that you're all well aware of of this neutron star merger, known as GW170817 uh, was, a, was a triumph for science, but it revealed many shortcomings that we wanna learn from. We know that collaboration members should be in control of their data and infrastructure, and that goes all the way down the stack. We need researchers to have as much control over their data and how they share it, being constrained only by policies and not by technical problems. And we want the DevOps people like myself and research programmers to have the freedom to innovate and improve upon this without being constrained by the rigidity of their hosting environment, whether that's Amazon, Google, or NCSA. Um, there's never gonna be a final software solution, right? For all future science projects. Surveys are always gonna need to adapt and improve to create new software to do their work. We wanna employ modern industry standard tools and practices whenever we can, um, following, you know, well-supported, battle-tested software patterns and frameworks. When you go to make a new Science Gateway web server, you know, maybe don't, maybe don't jump straight to PHP because that's what you learned when you were in school in the 90s. You know, let's see what frameworks are in wide use now <laughs> that we can leverage. Um, and finally, let's avoid large, uh, let's avoid vendor lock-in and, and more subtle forms of lock-in. Sometimes the cost-benefit analysis is gonna show it's better to pay for some licensed services, which is fine. But let's make sure we actually do that cost benefit analysis and see what's best for our communities. Uh, just to mention this, we are building on uh, tools that collaborations already use. Um, and this platform is in use today by uh, several projects. Starting with Des Access a few years ago uh, with the Dark Energy Survey, we have a science gateway and HPC backend deployed on Kubernetes. Um, for LSST, we built some components like job management system and a transfer monitor. Antares was a very um, fruitful adventure where we took a lot of the MMA alert processing cyber infrastructure you guys are probably familiar with. And we found a way to deploy it at NCSA and built a lot of the underpinnings of what I'm going to describe um, for this Antares at NCSA project. We have a prototype in development for SPT3G of a science gateway and HPC backend for an image cutout service uh, with an eye towards CMBS4 that's using this system. And we have the full suite of collaboration services uh, employed for this NSF funded Muses collaboration that just started. Additionally, we've used it for education and outreach activities like 
we had a girls astronomy summer camp in 2021 that um, using the system, I was able to basically within hours or a day or two spin up a Kubernetes cluster. So these teenage girls could use their own Jupiter lab system and learn about programming and, and astrophysics. So that was very rewarding for me. And this kind of ephemeral CI, you might call it, is uh, a potentially impactful use of systems like this. So before we get to the demos, I do wanna talk about um, what are some of these collaborative tools and services? So you, you know that you need online tools these days. Um, our framework really is aiming to do tightly coupled, well-supported collaborative tooling as much as possible based on decentralized, free and open source software. So some common things you need, you need file storage and sharing. Uh, for that, we've chosen Nextcloud, which is a mature, extensible, self-hosted cloud storage and groupware solution. Uh, you'll see some of that in the demos for sure. Uh, we often need organized and persistent asynchronous discussions like an internet forum and discourse is the king there. And discourse is the most popular self-hosted forum software. You've undoubtedly encountered it online somewhere. And the takeaway about it is that it has the sophisticated system that allows communities to kind of manage themselves and get admins out of the way. Uh, for real-time messaging and video conferencing, uh, we've selected Matrix. Um, and its flagship client app called Element, which you may not have heard of either of those. For the purposes of this talk, you can think of Matrix as email for the 21st century or an open source federated Slack. Those are sufficient. Like email, it's an open protocol for messaging. That means that anybody can communicate with anybody on that network. Um, and it's an important but subtle point. I don't expect you to appreciate at the moment, but it is fully decentralized in the sense that whenever you have conversations there, all of the participants equally engage. So the loss of one doesn't stop the flow of information between the others. Groups often need collaborative document editing. Everybody has Google Docs that they like to hack it, you know, composing stuff together. Here we have HedgeDoc, which is a nice markdown formatted, kind of a slick interface, a next cloud for office type editing. You'll see some of that later too. And finally, your favorite Jupyter Hub. Everybody loves Jupyter Hub for interactive development. Um, we have a Jupyter Hub environment. And finally, there's a website content management system, WordPress, because as old as it is, it sure does get the job done when you have something like, um, you know, a project landing page, you need help do updating without having to go to the sysadmin every time. And I guess what's, like one of the most compelling reasons um, you might use these services as opposed to some of the commercial solutions is because uh, these can all be used under one seamless unified login that works across all the services. We're going to come back to that in some of the first demos, that identity and access management perspective. So I'm just mentioning this here, this data lake. If any of you are familiar with this data lake vision that Gotham described so well in his Simitalk a few years ago, you'll notice striking similarities between the framework we're presenting here and uh, that vision. In many ways, Circuses is a realization of that vision. At a minimum, you could say it provides the terrain and topography upon which such a lake could form. Uh, this slide is just a way of showing that the modularity of this deployment system uh, you know, shows that, say, for our multiple projects that are using it, they don't all use the same set of services. Um, you'll notice it's kind of oddball for Antares out there. It's even running a Kafka cluster, which is deployed in a similar way to the discussion forum that Muses is using. So it's very, um, this is not a one size fits all framework. So as Gotham says, pictures are worth a thousand words and demos count for papers. So let's <laughs> look at some demonstrations. And by the way, if anybody has any questions or wants to you know, stop me in the middle of talking, please do so. Without being able to see anybody's face, it's really hard to gauge feedback, you know? I will say that the ephemeral CI uh, use case is great. My group has definitely done that sort of thing in the past. So we've tried to spin up little versions of this and to have like a out of the box or have like an, you know, just a single box to do that with would be amazing. We've yeah. also had like summer camps and stuff where we've done exactly what you described. Mm -hmm. and, and Chad, can I, can I just add to that? Um, my big use case for this ephemeral CI, this thing that we want to spin up and have people work on stuff 
uh, is really from LSST and my experience with LSST's dark energy science collaboration and the transient and variable science, science collaboration, both of which have hack weeks. Uh, and if you have to coordinate people on hack weeks right now, you have to go through this entire process of getting somebody a computer account on NERSC, which takes a week and a half by itself for the admins there to go ahead and approve things, uh, and then have them work on that together in some form uh, with an environment that they can't really control themselves. You need some system administrator in NERSC to put in Python packages and whatnot. And this is just so much easier if you want to package, Conda install the package and you're off and running within about five minutes. It's so much smoother for an actual collaboration. Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. So for, um, I guess, given the, that the majority of you in the audience are, are in the category of research scientists or application developers and not research programmers and DevOps engineers, uh, speak up if that's wrong. <laughs> I'm sure it's more engaging to see these demonstrations of how, you know, what things you could do with it. So in the following slides, we're going to try to do these things because you know how live demos are. It's just a, it's a fun, engaging thing because it can always crash and burn. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'm going to try to show you our identity and access management system from the perspective of somebody like signing up for the first time and getting access to a service. And then we're going to show off some hopscotch uh, publish, uh, publishing and consuming to private topics. Uh, we're going to use our, our Jupyter Hub environment deployed in one of these projects. We're going to show some real-time data analysis with that data. And then we're going to show a um, generation of alerts distributed on the matrix network, say to interested astronomers across the world, uh, with bridging to Slack, just to demonstrate that matrix is a, is a bridge between a lot of proprietary silos. Then we're going to try to show um, discussion and sharing of data between Jupyter and Nextcloud uh, that enables you to share things like with public links or through federated sharing um, for full control, and then some collaborative document editing. We'll see, we'll see how far we get. Um, so identity and access management. Let's look at the case of a new member joining a collaboration. Uh, excuse me. So let's say they are going to log in for the first time. Let's try this out. So I'm a new guy coming to the Antares at NCSA project, and I want to uh, get on my next cloud server. So I go there, and I see a button that says login with key cloak. And I'll explain what that is in a little bit. But that's our unified login button. So when I click that, I'm presented with a screen where I can choose the identity provider that I would like to use. Uh, I'm enlightened, so I'm going to use Orchid, a nice nonprofit that gives me control over my identity. I'm going to try to log in with that. Now, meanwhile, over here, um, I'll go ahead and open up the admin key cloak interface so you can kind of see this happening from the admin's perspective. So over here, we have a place where we can see all the users, all three of them for this. <laughs> um, and now I'm going to sign in. The new user is going to sign in with his ORCID ID. You notice I'm at the ORCID website here. So it's authenticating me and then passing back using the OpenID Connect uh, OAuth2 protocol back to the Keycloak server. Now Keycloak says, OK, you're authenticated. Uh, why don't you check out your account information? That username looks terrible. So we're going to make sure things look nice. And I say submit. And so I'm now I'm at Nextcloud, the thing I was trying to log into at first. This is the service I'm trying to access. It says, oh, your, your user group is not allowed. If we look over here, you can see now a new account has been provisioned automatically. So I, as the admin, can say, okay, well, this guy's legit. He's part of our collaboration. I'm going to grant him the proper role and group memberships he needs to access this particular service and many others. And so once that happens, uh, you know, he tells me that's that's happened or an email is triggered or something. And then I log in again. Oh, this happens sometimes because of cookies. Uh, let's try this again. It's going to work now. Yeah. OK, so now uh, Nextcloud has gotten the membership, the membership information, this role from Keycloak through that Open ID Connect procedure. And the configuration of Nextcloud says, okay, this guy can now log in. And so I have my you know, cloud file interface with calendars and um, all sorts of whirly gigs and doodads that I can use here. 
And so um, there's something else I wanted to mention. We'll come back to Nextcloud. Uh, let's just close him for now. So that's kind of a very simple onboarding procedure. There's more complex workflows that we've implemented for Muses, where somebody you know goes to a registration website. Maybe I'll just throw that up there so you can see it, just to get a flavor. Um, you know, if you have a new collaborator, you, you fill out a, a custom form that want, triggers emails to go to the leadership to accept or reject. When they accept, it automatically hits the API of things like Keycloak to add them to the right groups. So you don't have to do all this manually. Um, getting back to our presentation, the next thing I wanted to, to show, which I think is kind of uh, important, is uh, changing identity providers. So I, I kind of made this in case the demos didn't work. And by the way, this is using another hosted uh, collaborative document editor called uh, HedgeDoc, which you can share links with people to edit like a Google Doc. But that aside, just looking at the authentication we were talking about, um, imagine that I decide I want to change providers. Maybe I'm a graduate student and I've gotten a postdoc at another university. And now I'm going to have a different set of credentials. I'd like to use that to log in. Well, you can seamlessly change your identity provider without any of the services underneath noticing. It's transparent to them. And so this process is simple. I could demonstrate it, but I, I don't know if it's worth the time unless somebody in particular wants to see that. So speak up if you'd like that. I can show it. I think we could show it at the end if there was time and someone was interested, but one of yeah. we get through. That's that, a good that, idea. Was really, that was really powerful. Yeah, good. Um, so I just wanted to quickly uh, reiterate what is happening here for people that are interested. We, we use a Keycloak server, which is a, a free and open source identity and access management um, service you run on your own hardware. And it uses an external service called CI Logon that NCSA um, operates, but uh, to be the identity provider. So you got a user here who wants to log into a web service like Nextcloud. Nextcloud says, hey, Keycloak, who is this guy? Keycloak says, CI Logon, who is this guy? <laughs> and CI Logon says, uh, what identity provider do you want? Here's the ones that the admins have said are kosher. And so that's that knocks your authentication all the way back. The authorization layer about whether you can then do anything after you're authenticated is within the control of the collaboration in Keycloak. So what's nice about this is if one day you don't like to use CI Logon or whatever, you can just hook in something else here and it won't screw you up. Um, yeah, so I think that's the main point I wanted to give there. And the kind of uh, what this implies is that you can you can distribute responsibility by making the right role based access groups um, and using using the system judiciously. For instance, I don't know if you can see it here, but I'm just showing how there's a user group called SPT uh, or Jupyter admins, basically. And if you put somebody in that group, then when they log into Jupyter, Jupyter Hub will say, oh, he's considered an admin or she's considered an admin. So I'm going to let them help manage the servers that are running. Um, so anyway, it's a way to delegate some responsibility. A lot of the, the ethos here is that responsibility, responsibility should be delegated as far down as it can or, or up away from sysadmins, right? You need to be in control of your collaboration so, project. Um, Andrew, there's a, there's a question from uh, Karan says, uh, curious, but does Keycloak support Atlassian Crowd? That might be a bit in the weeds, I don't know if you know what I don't know. Uh, I don't personally know um, that Keycloak natively supports SAML and OpenID Connect. So if Atlassian Crowd uh, supports standard OpenIDC protocol, then yes. Oh yeah, Gautam just pasted a link oh. that actually explaining how to do it. Thanks, Gautam. Good. Good job. Um, Oh, so like if, yeah, this is a quick little demo of this response, shared responsibility. Um, so in our Muses collaboration, for instance, we have a seminar, right? We have a seminar like a lot of people do. You have some kind of talk like this one I'm in right now. And uh, you don't want the sysadmin to have to update this public website every time. And so what we're able to do is I'm able to log in with my standard credentials. And after, say, the postdoc, who I delegated this task to logged in, I was able to go to him and say, give him an editor role, All right? So it was very easy to just put somebody in there with the right 
uh, permissions in this particular application. So now he can edit this and keep it up to date. So it's just an example of a integration. <clears throat> um, let's get to the fun hopscotch stuff. I'm sure that everybody wants to see that. So the first thing we're gonna do is a very simple thing where uh, I'm gonna run two Jupyter notebooks and one of them is going to be publishing to a private hopscotch topic. The other is gonna be reading. So let's open those up, see if Jupyter, no. Okay, so it's kicking me immediately to authenticate. Now I have to do two factor because we have to do that a thousand times a day. <clears throat> and it's not running, so we gotta. So right now it's it's spinning up if we wanted to. We could look over here at the Antares Kubernetes cluster. at the pods in the Jupyter space. And you can see that Kubernetes is spinning up this Jupyter Lab server just for me. Once it comes online, the interface boots up. So let's close these two. All right, so I'm gonna to go to Jupyter Share Andrew, and I'm gonna open up um, these two, pub and sub. I don't know if everybody can read that text. I'm sorry if it's small. Um, so on the what I'm going to do over here is I'm going to uh, select the URL for the private hopscotch topic that I'm interested in, in this case, Circuses Demo. And I do want to say thank you to um, Chris Weaver, who graciously provided us with this group and topic just, just for this demo. And I was happy that I could use this opportunity to learn more about hopscotch as well. Um, I'm going to make sure my authentication key is registered or loaded. And I'm going to just pick some random GCN circular, basically, that, that I'm going to shove in there. Before I push it, though, I'm going to go to an independent notebook, which could be you know anything on the internet listening, the right credentials. I'm going to define a function for sending an alert on the matrix network. The details aren't super important, but it is just a standard HTTP REST API. Um, and I'm going to load the credentials that that is going to the the bot account i'm using in order to send that message because matrix is very secure by design there's there's uh, the usual credentials you need for things and so now we're going to read we're going to start reading the messages in this private topic so i'm going to open up a stream using the hopscotch api python api and you see this is running now over here i'm going to push that gcn circular into the kafka stream and over here, it detected it, it pulled it, it consumed it. And as soon as it did, it sent a matrix alert. And you notice that I got a notification. Notification from what? In this case, I'm running uh, a matrix client called Element, and I'm just running the browser-based version to keep it simple. And if we go over there, you see what is a very Slack-like interface in this case. That's one reason this client is so popular. Um, uh, I made a space, this is like a workspace for Sima on Matrix, um, just to demonstrate this, and there's a room called alerts, uh, and you'll see that I just got an alert from this NCSA bot. So the idea is that anybody could be subscribed to this, this room and get alerts on their phone, you know, or whatever. And one thing that's really cool here is the bridging capability of Matrix. Not only did that alert go to every server connected to that room, but it should have also gone to the Sima alerts demo uh, channel that is bridged to Matrix. So you see this, this bot through the Slack integration app, um, send it there too. So um, we can talk more about Matrix bridging if people have questions, but that's kind of like a, a way to distribute messages based on what's happening in some arbitrary code. Uh, the next thing I wanted to show, next demo, uh, is courtesy of Deep Chatterjee. He's a CAPS fellow at NCSA. Um, we're going to do something very similar, but this time we're going to push custom data, uh, this GW170817 photometric data from ECAM. We're going to push that into this topic, and then we're going to be consuming it in real time, updating a plot and running a classification algorithm on it. As each data point is received, you're going to see this classification confidence increase. So I'm going to close these guys. Uh, 
can't publish now anyway. Science goes left to right, doesn't it? So here, we're, here in this notebook, we're going to set up so that it's ready to publish. Basically, he's taken this uh, data and just put it in a pickle file that he's just going to take snippets of and shove into the topic with a little time delay artificially introduced here. So we're going to load up. I don't know if this is going to work. I might have to show a video, but we'll see. This is, I think, listening now, uh, and now I'm going to I'm going to start pushing data into the the topic. Oh, it's working. Yeah, so it's just kind of it's not updating a single plot for me at the moment. I think I didn't post updated code. I apologize, Deep. This was way slicker when he uh, gave it to me. But you can see that his classification algorithm is is converging as more and more data is uh, consumed from that and over here uh, i should be able to stop this guy oh and and i assume this will stop too when it stops pushing data yeah um so i'm not sure how confusing that was if anybody has questions please yes thank you deep there is a screencast available that's much better uh, so just to also questions. explain what you are seeing on the right hand side there is the classification probability of kilonova versus not kilonova and on yes. the left hand side you're actually seeing the light curve of gw 17 uh, as it's streaming in from the notebook on the left uh, so every time a new alert comes in with one or more detections the classifier, El Cid, which Deep already has presented at a SIMA talk, and again, that's linked in the slides, uh, updates. And so this is all running within the circuses framework. This isn't you know, some academic paper that we wrote with code that nobody will ever use. This can actually be done, uh, applied to, to a real science object uh, in a real framework running on real data today. That's right. Thank you, Gotham, for saving that. Um, so we're going to move on in the interest of time. Uh, yeah, those links are, are here in the talk. And the videos are uh, linked as well. I'll try to make that more permanent somewhere as well. Um, so what else can you do with this, this system? Uh, to say you've done all this great science with hopscotch and, and plotting things, and now you want to share your work with others. Um, so other another integration between otherwise independent third party applications to say between Jupyter Hub and Nextcloud. Um, so this demo we're going to show how how you might share something. There's too many useful features of Nextcloud to mention in this talk. Uh, I encourage you to look into it. It's really impressive. But uh, let me open up. So this is the um, Nextcloud in the Antares at NCSA project where we were just running those Jupyter notebooks. So I'm going to log in for the thousandth time as an Antares project collaborator. And you notice something here. If we look back at that window, I should not have closed. You'll notice that there is this folder called Jupyter Share. That is actually a special mounted Kubernetes volume that is shared between both Jupyter Hub and Nextcloud. And so that allows um, that allows somebody to access those files from basically anywhere Nextcloud can can connect you. So, for instance, uh, in the web interface, I can see those files. If I go here, I can see those notebooks. If I have the Nextcloud uh, desktop or mobile app, you know, I can look at my Antares files that have been, that are syncing locally to my machine. And if I choose, I can even sync those external uh, those external folders as well, so I can work with things locally. Change the file here, it shows up there. Now, say I wanted to share some data that was generated here. Well, one way I could do it is to share uh, with a public link. Maybe I want to share a public link that somebody can also upload and edit to, right? And so I copy that. I open up a private window and open that guy up where I'm not authenticated. And uh, I can see all those files. And so that's great. Let's make sure all the other.
close that. Okay. So then uh, there's also another way. The next cloud is federated. So instead of just having to do something with a public link, I can actually do something more secure. Imagine that uh, a collaborator in the Antares and NCSA project or SIMA wanted to share a file with somebody um, in the you know CMBS4 or DES uh, project. In this case, we'll we'll use the Muses project because that's where we have an xCloud server. So over here, I'm now logging in as a Muses collaborator. Oh boy. Two-factor authentication, apologies. And CSA is strict about these things. Okay, so now that uh, what I can do is I can share a federated identity or a, like a, an address. So I'll go to my user settings over here, go to sharing. And I see this federated cloud ID. Now I send that to my co my collaborator over in the other um, Antares and NCSA project. And they go to share that this way. And then on my end, I'll get a notification that says, hey, somebody from a different Nextcloud server is trying to share files with you. Uh, you've received this data as a remote share. Would you like to accept it? You can say yes, accept. And now I can see those files natively, um, which is great. It would also synchronize to my devices if I had sync clients enabled. And so this is a very, very tight, federated, seamless way to share data on completely independent projects. These people do not have to have the same identity and access management or anything. Um, and of course, system administrators can, can limit this to however they need to, depending on the requirements of their um, project. But most of these type of projects that you're interested in have open enough policies that the only thing usually stopping people is technical reasons, not you know national security policies or whatever. Does anybody, any, does anyone have any questions about that before I move on? There have been some questions, but Gautam is uh, busily asking them in the Zoom, answering okay. them. The Zoom. Yeah, and, and don't don't feel afraid to uh, just pop up and start talking. I mean, that's uh, that's nice to hear people's voices and see faces. Oh, and this is interesting. So you'll notice I just got an email um, that went somewhere. Yeah, so I just got an email. Um, that, you know, so there's this integration with email for all these services, as you're familiar with, you know, if you miss a Slack message, it emails you. In Nextcloud, you can opt into all these notifications. So this is showing me, hey, somebody shared something with you. Clearly, this key cloak identifier is, is wretched. That's something that I'm sure we can improve upon uh, in terms of display. But the point is, I can see that someone shared something with me, you know, with a notification, and that's nice. Uh, and, oh, I just got an email that... Uh, that uh, I, the SIM alert, <laughs> so it automatically sent me an email because this account, you know, missed that notification. That's a nice little demo there. All right, the next thing I'd like to show um, is that we have a flexible pattern for generating and deploying custom science gateways and asynchronous job management backends like HPC. Uh, starting with Des Access, we developed um, this system, and it was all supported by Antares and LSS T work as well. What I'm going to demo here is our application in this SPT 3G prototype uh, cutout service, where we have a front end and a back end. The front end is a React JS based standard kind of framework, um, and the back end is an API server. It's Python based. Uh, those of you that use Django, I think maybe in the SIMA are familiar with you know Python programming on the back end. Uh, where we've integrated this open ID connect based authentication for the web interfaces. So just like Nextcloud, Jupyter Hub, uh, Matrix, all these different third party applications are supporting open ID connect so that our unified login works. This now custom backend that we have written for the science use case uh, also needs to implement that so that we can take advantage of that same system. So this is getting into the custom software, but we're following patterns that are easily translatable to other projects. So this was this was lifted in large part from these other projects. Is what I'm trying to say. We get a benefit there, a force multiplier. So if we open up SBT 3G prototype, um, launch the app. Oh, login again. <laughs> They're all independent, so I'm not logged into one versus the other. 
All right, what you'll see here right away is a very simple web interface that I'm sure many people are familiar with. Um, there's an API access token. So if I was gonna do something in Jupyter or you know, for my local machine programmatically, or if I was building a third-party application to use this service, I could use one of these API tokens to do so. Uh, and I can submit a, an HPC you know, computing job, basically a bunch of parallel image cutting operations using this. And I have, you know, little widgets to look at the status and see how it's doing. If we look back in Kubernetes land at this different Kubernetes cluster, you'll see that a, a Kubernetes job was just spawned a few seconds ago. And so that is actually doing the work. And it triggered an email when it finished and said, hey, your job is done. Um, if I look back at the, the status, you know, now I can see things like the log. I can download my files that were generated from this. So this, this kind of general pattern is something that's very generic. Um, I'd like to note that even though we're running these HPC jobs on our Kubernetes cluster itself uh, and leveraging its own job management system, uh, the back end is flexible. Like right now in Muses, we're working to integrate the NCSA Delta HPC system the new NCSA Delta system because they want to leverage these GPUs that are going to be available. Uh, we can also in principle integrate other ones like cloud service providers, you know, Amazon and Google have their own backends. Um, we have some example of, uh, you know, Las Cumbres Observatory. They use Amazon S3 uh, for doing some processing. Uh, that kind of integration is possible as well. It's really trying to be as agnostic as, as it can about backends. Um, so going back to our presentation, does anybody have any questions about that? I know we're running out of time, but fortunately I don't have too much more to show. And I'll just about tell you got 15 minutes, but. Um, okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll just kind of, I'm not going to do a demo oh, of data training. Yes. So Ron Taipei has his hand up. Oh, I, I just wanted, uh, you don't mention anything like GitLab or GitHub in any of the services that you mentioned in your talk. Uh, Is that important for collaboration or are they just like water and air? <laughs> no, that's a good point. I We are using, in fact, for all of this deployment, I'll barely have time to talk about it. It's also not necessarily totally relevant for this group, but uh, this, this whole deployment strategy and infrastructure is built on this GitOps paradigm, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with, the idea that everything is code. So for instance, if we, if we wanted to look at um, uh, SPT Kubernetes, I don't know what I do without browser history. I would never know where anything was. So yeah, so speaking of GitLab, we are using this uh, commercial service to host our code because, you know, like I was talking about before, the cost benefit analysis, how much do you need to self-host and how much can you leverage existing services? We chose GitLab to host the repository that drives our Kubernetes deployment. Uh, so what you see in this repository, these apps, Helm charts, scripts, source code, uh, this code determines what is running actively on this cluster. And it does that through a tool called Argo CD, which constantly reads that repository and updates the resources in Kubernetes like a state controller or a thermostat to make sure that we are adhering to the configuration we've committed. Um, and so this is an example. I personally chose GitLab not only because of its nice features. It has these container registries for images and built-in wikis and stuff like that. But GitLab itself can be self-hosted. So if at some point GitLab.com starts doing things we don't like or crowds us out, uh, there's nothing stopping us from running our own GitLab and having a more or less seamless migration. Whereas GitHub does not, as far as I know, allow self-hosting. Um, but you could use GitHub if you want, that's fine. That's a good question. Does that answer your question or did I just blabber? No, that, that's good. I just wanted to, well, are you using it at all for uh, collaboration among scientists? Uh, I have used it. I guess a good example would be on GitHub, say recently in a data release for the Dark Energy Survey, this Y3 cosmology data. We like to, you know, we need to update the data release website that, that provides links to the files, the science behind the data. Right. But I, you know, you don't want system administrators to, to have to do this. So we have uh, code that generates that website and 
we've configured it so that commits to that repository trigger image builds that change what's running on Kubernetes and automatically updates this site. And so a scientist uh, is able to contribute commit changes using this easy to use interface if they want. I can review them in a pull request. And if it all looks good and the collaboration agrees, I hit merge and basically everything's automated to, to publish. So we definitely use those tools uh, interacting with scientists to, again, delegate tasks as they should be delegated, I think. Thank you. you know, that's a good question. Yeah, we definitely do use outside services like that. Um, Oh yeah, I, I mentioned. <laughs> I was going to mention that right here. So all I wanted to show here about data transfer is that again, like with this recent data release, sometimes you have very large amounts of data you need to transfer. Um, uh, for for whatever reason, it might not even be ast astronomy data itself. It may just be you know products or, or things you've generated. And I know that there are these great platforms like Globus that offer a wealth of uh, services, but often those can be very expensive, and for smaller organizations, that may be a constraint. I just wanted to mention that we we have integrated, say, with Des and have the potential to do it with others, um, peer to peer solutions like SyncThing that use a BitTorrent like protocol to pretty much magically sync information anywhere. And we've used that uh, to great effect in Des. You can also integrate that with NextCloud like, like we did, so that whether somebody is sending large amounts of data through SyncThing or just dragging and dropping some little data files in the NextCloud interface, it all consolidates into one place. For us to publish uh, when the time is ready. So I'm not really going to go too much into this because we're mostly out of time. I did want to just kind of mention to the people that are cyber infrastructure experts in the audience that everything we're doing is built on virtual machine containerization and Kubernetes revolution. And the primary reason that we are we are doing that is because it's an industry standard that's well supported. And it again uh, separates these roles. There's a division of labor that you desperately need these days. Um, basically, this nexus of needs between researchers in a collaboration like you who want tools to advance science but don't want to focus on package management or something, uh, computing facilities like NCASA who operate and develop, like in my case, the CI itself, but don't want to write machine learning filters for MMA science. Uh, and then finally, at the lowest level, the system administrators who really need to spend all their time making sure the you know, storage and networking is working, but don't have time for any of the stuff on top. So this containerized Kubernetes-based framework is critical to achieving that and to establish this modularity of services. Um, it's not even worth really talking about the extra components at this point, but if somebody wants to ask questions about the overall system architecture, I'm happy to answer. I've already mentioned GitOps a little bit, but I want to tie in this idea that code drives everything, um, not just the deployed services, but the hardware itself. There's something called Terraform, where you can do an infrastructure as code. Basically, you write a repository, apply that using Terraform, and it will spin up virtual machines. It'll bootstrap an entire set of virtual networking devices and everything you need to have uh, this substrate upon which you can develop and launch applications for your research collaboration. And what I wanted to, what is most relevant, I think, to a lot of you is that this is um, actually applicable to data provenance and the reproducibility of scientific results, because there are more and more ways in which uh, scientific results are intertwined with the state of the cyber infrastructure at the time they were generated. Like, it's getting kind of ridiculous, as, as you might be aware. I mean, a simple example is some libraries, you know, Python libraries are used in uh, some calculation software. They're found later to have, after it was published, they're found to have some sort of bugs that may invalidate the calculation. And just knowing what was used to generate that data to know whether, uh, you know, those bugs even apply is very similar to, you know, the sophisticated systems that like GitHub uses to say, hey, we notice your software has a dependency on X, Y, and Z, and those have a, um, you know, security flaw that you need to look into. We can start to do that with scientific programming as well. So conclusion slide, this is the most important takeaway, I think, is that circuses is a framework designed to provide key elements of the cyber infrastructure for large surveys and experiments uh, to build a research platform uh, for collaborative science. 
It's been design, designed from the ground up to meet the needs of SIMA and other major projects that I mentioned before, but it's not constrained to physics and, ast and astronomy. It's easy to deploy, relatively speaking, of course, you still have to have people that know about Kubernetes and whatnot, but in the context of people that would do the work, it is easy. Um, it has seamless identity and access management that can be applied in a federated way across surveys that integrates a lot of the tools you need. Uh, this kind of GitOps paradigm we're following allows custom components because they're always gonna need custom components for different projects. It should already be able to integrate with other products, projects of interest that I'll let you follow the links to later. As we showed, it, even, it meets the science requirements for MMA experiments as laid out by uh, the mentioned paper and some, some others um, reiterated in this decadal survey. And something I haven't been able to get into too much, but sharing this infrastructure across multiple surveys really lowers the cost. Uh, where you can centralize and share and pool resources at the lower levels, you can start to, to uh, save money for the individual collaborations using this stack. Leading to what is, you know, this fosters a sustainability model is what we're getting to. If, and if you compare uh, what we have to SIMA's own research platform diagram, then we, we've already demonstrated, you know, several of the components. Some are in progress or, and some will need more funding to be realized. And so I guess finally, I'd like to say that you can consider the Center for Astrophysical Surveys or CAPS at NCSA kind of a one-stop shop for survey science. We have the facilities, the staff, and the expertise to host this full stack cyber infrastructure. Uh, we're a nonprofit embedded in a university focused on these kind of uh, projects. We have a wealth of research programmers like myself that have backgrounds in science, like serious backgrounds, that can bridge a gap that often exists and something you can't get from the Google and the Amazon at least not for anything reasonably priced. <laughs> um, we have on-premises superconducting and cloud computing hardware, and that's something not many places can say. With dedicated network and storage engineers, I work with daily who are really, um, really great. And CAPS brings us all together under, under one roof that kind of reduces you know, things like bureaucracy and increases support. So um, just let us know if you're interested in, in coordinating in any way. So with that, I thank you. and. Hope you have time for a question or two. Thanks very much, um, Andrew. I think everyone, you know, from the science side, will know to appreciate how useful this is. And but those of us on the other side who tried to implement this sort of thing will know how difficult it can be. And uh, that your demos work so well is remarkable. Every time you had new demos, and you're pushing your luck. But that, that was really good. <laughs> um, so I. We're, uh, we are somewhat short of time. If anybody wants to raise their hand with a question, I, I, I do have a question that I can ask perhaps while people are thinking about that. So if someone did want to get started and you had that sort of contact page at the end, and um, I guess they, they might want to, um, to partner with you or if, if they wanted to sort of take some of the lessons and, and implement their own for some reason, you know, like sort of proprietary arrangements or something like that. Um, what, what, what's the best way for them to get started? Uh, I think that, yeah, individual conversations are the best way to, to triage those kind of collaborations. I think just c communicating with me, uh, people like Gotham directly, are, are the way to start start the conversation. Okay, and how, how much, as a matter of interest, how, how much um, code or sort of glue scripts did you have to write versus being able to take stuff off the shelf and configure it and get it to work? <laughs> basically all of it so i wrote the i wrote the api server that does the kubernetes jobs and i wrote the react front end and i wrote all the little glue and there's not it, these days there's not as much glue for things like in jupiter hub but there is still some you know the um the little bits of magic you sprinkle in to make jupiter hub work with the key cloak server uh it's pretty much it's mostly been me that's what i've spent most of my time on at ncsa is this this system and there there's, you know, Kubernetes is still new enough that while there is growing expertise in Kubernetes itself at NCSA, it's not like everybody knows Kubernetes like everybody knows the Linux command line. So it's still a blossoming uh, field of expertise. Right. Um, and then um, we have a, another question there from, from Kostya. Uh, do, do you want to, answer, to, to ask it, Kostya, or would you like me to ask it for you? Security. 
I think I will t try to ask. So uh, can we uh, write, create um, services, web services, uh, where can be, uh, which can be accessed uh, through the internet? And if yes, uh, how we can control, how admins can control security and debt access policies? Oh, and right. If no, if, <laughs> and if no, it is not. Yeah, no, I, I, it's a good question. The The level of deployment uh, or network interaction you're talking about is, is pretty low down at the Kubernetes level. And so you're only going to have one or two or, you know, some small set of uh, Kubernetes administrators that have the rights to deploy things that would use an open network ports. So like in our, in our situation, um, someone can be developing an application like a, a, a research application developer could be iterating on code, but um, and they may be updating something we already have running for the interest of their efficiency, but they're not going to be able to run something new, like anything that is actively deployed has gone through, you know, like the security considerations by people further down. In other words, we're not allowing people to spin up random VMs, even those Jupyter notebooks, you notice. So uh, when you log in, you get your own Jupyter lab server, but you as the end user can't change the configuration of that. You can use it and install things within its little environment, but you can't change what the, you know, like the port configuration of that server. Um, but no, the security implications are more challenging in this containerized environment. There's no doubt about that. Uh, wait, but user could run their own containers. For example, could I run my own Jupyter server with a Python 3.0? for if I really like to do it. You would not be able to spawn your own containers unless we somehow gave you, you know, the ability to do that through Argo or something like that. But like say that the typical person in a research collaboration uh, cannot run their own containers. They can use services that are running in containers, but those are um, vetted by the, the smaller set of administrators. You see what I mean? I can, I can talk with you uh, more offline. Yeah, 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 thanks, uh, it is confusing. Uh, sorry, yeah, uh, it's fine, thank you. Okay, um, so what we are at the hour, and this is great, and Andrew, I think you've just uh, demonstrated your willingness to answer more questions to people if they contact you um, uh, directly. And um, Gatham, I think, has uh, the, so the, the, the astronomer side of, um, of it. So if, if people have specific questions about the astronomy, then that would um, then that will be directed perhaps to both of you, to Gautam and to Andrew. But mm -hmm. thank you very much. This will be on our um, on our semi YouTube channel uh, when it's finished processing. And I, th I think from from the from the comments in chat, we can see that everybody really enjoyed this. This this was a really powerful and interesting demonstration of the, the sort of things that can now be now be done with cyber instructors to support um to support scientific collaborations so th thanks very much andrew and thanks to everyone for attending thank you